The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everyone, to a very special episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great pleasure to have with me my co-host, Elliot Turner, and we have a special guest today, someone I've known for quite a few years now and very excited to see his new book out. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, Vitaly Katzenelson is here. I'll let Elliot introduce Vitaly properly here, um, and I really look forward to the conversation. I think it's going to be a terrific one. So, Elliot, let's uh, go ahead with it. Thank you, John, and thank you, Vitaly, for joining us. Vitaly is, is the, yeah, Vitaly is the CIO of Denver-based value investing firm IMA. I was first introduced to Vitaly in December 2010 way back when, uh, I was working at a trade desk and writing blogs. I hardly knew a thing about investing. And Vitaly had just written The Little Book of Sideways Markets. I was asked to read the book and interview him by Wall Street Cheat Sheet, for whom I was uh, sometimes writing for at the time. I loved the book, enjoyed the interview, and then had the opportunity to meet Vitaly in person on a visit of his to New York City. It wasn't until early in the COVID crisis that Vitaly and I truly forged a bond. We were pulled together in a group by a mutual friend, and we now meet regularly through Zoom. It's part of what has kept me sane during the COVID years and this present market volatility. I'm lucky to have learned a lot from Vitaly's willingness to share his accumulated worldly wisdom. His new book, Soul in the Game, is a collection of essays that will be invaluable for any reader, whether an investor or not. And I know we're mostly investors uh, listening here, but there are lessons drawn from Vitaly's own life and experiences, as well as his deep interest in art, opera, and the Stoics. In fact, there's only one essay that directly covers investing, and it's one that I think is incredibly timely. We'll definitely be talking about that in this podcast. I'd read an early copy of the book many months ago and knew this particular essay was good. But when I reread it leading up to this podcast, man, did it hit me in a powerful way. Um, in the meantime, welcome to the podcast, Vitality. Thank you for joining us. And why don't you tell us what inspired you to write this book? Oh, well, first of all, Elliot and John, thank you so much. And I am I really was looking towards this podcast for a long time. And Elliot, you and I talked about this. And I said, well, let's do it when the book is out. And I was really looking forward to it. And I'm a big fan of both of you guys. Um, so what, what happens is this. I, I started writing investment articles a long, long time ago. And I would write these articles and I would send them out. But they would get published in the institutional investor magazines website or market watch or financial times. But then, then I would also send it out, this article, share them with friends initially. And then, you know, the, it's kind of the, this newsletter, you know, turned from being uh, just shared with friends to share it with a lot of people. But I, all, I would always, I started to write a little bit about life, like a little bit about my trips to Santa Fe or, my interactions with my kids, et cetera. And, and over time, uh, like these, I ended up writing a lot of life articles. And, P, and then my readers would get back to me and say, Vitaly, you should take these articles and put them into a book. And I'll be honest, to do this requires a lot of confidence and a lot of arrogance. Uh, because like, you know, when I, do, when I write about investing, now, I have a, two finance degrees. I have a CFA. I've been doing it for 25 years, right? So I'm qualified to write about investing. But to write, to write about life, I didn't go to a special university <laughs> where I learned, you know, like about parenting or whatever. You know, I struggled through parenting as much as everybody else. But in August 2020, 
right in the middle of COVID. I was like early in the morning, I was sitting, I just, I was going to write about Tchaikovsky's sixted uh, for string for strings. And sixted means it's a piece for six instruments. Um, and, you know, as I normally do, I try to read as much as, uh, as possible about the piece. And then I learned how much Tchaikovsky struggled composing that piece. And what's, what's important to understand, when we think of composers and we listen to the music, we see how beautiful it is, but we don't think about all the struggle that goes into it. And so when I read about, you know, this Tchaikovsky's incredible travails and struggle with that, I realized that, yes, I don't write, you know, I don't write beautiful music, but his struggles look very similar to right, you know, the struggles I go through when I write. And I wrote this article, ended up writing this article, you know, what was going to be an article comparing Tchaikovsky's issues with writing. And when I finished it, I looked at it and I realized this will actually help people. Somebody who is, wants to learn how to write by reading this article, you know, that's, you know, this will benefit them. And then I realized over the last 20 something years, I wrote a lot of essays like that. And this was my first motivation to kind of to put them together and to, and to write a book. It gets more interesting. So I put them together and I was gonna start editing it and, you know, and I was gonna self publish it. And then I get email from Harriman House, which is a British publisher. And I met him when I was in London, uh, speaking at the Value Invest, uh, Van London Value Conference. And the email said, Vitaly, you were working on this book. How's it going? And at the time, I was working on investment in book. And I said, listen, that investment book, it's been iced. But I have this interesting project. And I send them the kind of the Word document with those essays. And I said, I would like to publish this. And they come back to me and said, let's do it. So like... Guys, just you have to understand, at this point, I was questioning their sanity. I actually reached out to two of my friends just to find out if there's something wrong with these guys, if there is a who wants to publish my essays. <laughs> and both of my friends who, one of them, you know, both are very successful authors who publish books with them. They gave a glowing review to, the, uh, to this publisher. And so this is basically how this book came about. Very interesting. And yeah, you know, I've been subscribed to your essays for quite a while. And I always love how you use paintings from your father in them, talk about concepts well beyond uh, just investing, even when it's about investing. And, you know, I think part of what you're what, what I hear when you talk about creating the, the book itself, um, you get at it in the end, but you talk about this, and I don't want to give away the ending, but, um, sure. you know, you talk about this idea of art being defined by tension. And this idea of creative dis discomfort. So, you know, yeah. maybe talk about the, that a little and how you felt that along the way. I mean, you got at it, but I thought that was really interesting. I've always been intrigued by those concepts like tension yeah. and discomfort. Yeah, well, so anything you do that is creative, be it writing, painting, or investing, any, any creative activity comes with a certain amount of tension because if because you don't know exactly what the final product is going to look like, right? You don't know exactly when you buy a stock if it's going to work out or not, right? And as Seneca has this um, phrase that always at the top of my mind when I think about life and investing, time discovers truth. Think about investing. It's kind of what, what we do, right? We just try to discover truth before time does, right? And um, when you think, so when I, like, let me just use an, uh, writing as an analogy for this. When I sit down to write, I have a kind of a slight inkling of an idea, but I really have no idea. I don't have the full idea developed. I don't know how I'm going to get to where I want to get. So what's driving me at that point in time is my curiosity. So that's the positive driver. But then there's a negative driver that's fear. And the fear because, well, what if I won't get there? What if I won't be able to figure this out? And a lot of times it's a very frustrating, like, like there's this tension creates uh, this frustration a lot of times, right? Pain. Because sometimes, like I cannot tell you how many times I spent three weeks uh, for uh, three weeks showing up every morning at five o'clock in the morning you know, with a date, the two date with my computer, headphones, 
classical music and a cup of coffee. And there was, there was a, like a few months ago, this happened to me for three weeks, I would show up and I get absolutely nothing. Three weeks. Just imagine this is like, like uh, that's 21 days. That's 42 hours. That's 42 hours. And I get absolutely nothing. And uh, so any creative activity is going to have that tension, but the curiosity uh, eventually, in the case, you know, when it comes to writing, you know, an investment for me always wins because like, you know, at some point I succeed. Yeah. I'm curious. What does writing nothing look like? Is it like you're writing a paragraph and you're like, I don't like this erase, or is it like, I don't really know where I'm going with this. And how do you wrestle with that? No, it's a, actually, it's a lot of control enter. Let me explain what I mean. <laughs> when I type and it looks like junk, I just hit control enter and it creates a brand new page and I keep writing again. I think literally like this, writing nothing because it was nothing that kind of made sense to me or nothing that was connecting to things. I think I literally had probably maybe five or 10,000 words of nothing. Like just something I couldn't use. And that's, you know, that's what a lot of times it, you know, uh, it is. But if you think about writing for a second, what writing is, is basically connecting your conscious mind to your subconscious mind. Like, like, let me give you this analogy. I look at subconscious mind as this, in the terms that this, this audience will be able to relate to, AWS, okay? This incredible, powerful computer where your conscious mind is more like, uh, it's still a powerful computer, but it's like an iPhone like the power of iPhone. And by me, by forcing myself to focus for two hours straight, what I'm doing, I'm trying to create this connection between conscious mind and subconscious mind. And here's the thing, and this is important to understand, you know how in investing effort and outcome are not directly related? You know, there was a, a lot of times mm-hmm. there was delays, okay? It's one well, of the hardest problems. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Same thing happens with the subconscious mind. Because what happens, like the reason I used to get upset when I would like, you know, show up on this date with my computer and I get nothing. And then I realized, actually, I am planting seeds in my subconscious. It just, they might give, they might give fruit when I'm walking in the park or when I'm taking a shower. You have no idea when the idea will finally get baked in the subconscious mind. and. Actually, uh, my wife, like my wife would, would, use, would, use, you know, would ask me, well, well, how much did you write today? And I would say absolutely nothing. And she would give me this look. And I actually, I, for a while, would feel guilty about this, right? Because she thought I was wasting my time. But then I, now I just basically, when, I, when nothing happens, I just close my computer uh, you know, and, and just and go to work. And I just realized that's, that's the price you pay for being in the, you know, doing something creative. You just, it's the, there is this delayed impact between effort and outcome. Yeah. So let me ask you this, is your idea generation process and investing similar to how you approach writing, you know, start with the blank slate and just wrestle with certain tensions. So I call you a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good idea. <laughs> no, um, no. So the way I look at it, I, I try to create deliberate uh, randomness, meaning I have no idea where the ideas will come from. You really, you really don't, but you have to be on the lookout for them and you have to be doing like turning rocks you know, to get them. Um, so I talk to, you know, I, I read a lot, you know, like everybody else does. And I talk to a lot of people and, and sometimes something, you know, something clicks with me or I, I think of a theme or whatever, and then I'm like, oh, like, I should look into this. Or like you and I would be, I might be having a conversation, and I'm like, well, this actually, I get it. Like this, this one actually makes a lot of sense to me. Sometimes it won't, and you know, and that's just you know different. Um, and uh, it just has to fit me. Like you know, the idea that's you know, it you know, uh, so it's a it's a, it's a deliberate randomness. Do you journal for investing? You know what I. This is one of the things I wish I did. And let me tell you, and I really tried, and I think I stuck with it maybe for a couple of weeks at at one point in time. My problem is I can't do it in the morning because this is when I write. And I feel this is competing with my like writing, writing. 
So the way I should be doing, uh, the, the way I should be journaling is that maybe when I go back to, you know, to sleep. So I should be, when I, before I go to sleep, that's when I should be journaling. For when we buy a stock, I usually, um, like we use uh, this system called Rome Research, where we put all our notes. And usually I put like bullets, like, you know, I, I put bullets while we buy a stock. But I, the thing is, I should like, like this is one of the things that I, highly advise others, even though I've been failing at that. Yeah, but by the way, that, that means absolutely nothing. It just, you know, it's a knowing that you should be doing and not always be able to do this. Like if I'll give you one, I'll just, I'll, I'm going to take a detour for a second. I was just talking to my stepmom and she's reading my book and uh, she's like, well, the stoic stuff you talk about, you know, you should really reread this. <laughs> because you're not always behaving, you know, like you're supposed to. And I said, this is, a, I, the fact that I know that I'm failing is already a big part of it. I'm, I'm striving to behave according to certain principles, but it's a practice. And if you're not aware that you are behaving poorly, then you can't get better. But if you are aware, you can improve. And so the same thing, you know, comes with writing, you know, with a writing journal, I would like to write it, and at some point I'll get there. Uh, and I th- and I, my advice to listeners would be do that if you can. And even though at this point in time I've been failing at you know, that. Yeah, well, let's talk about the Stoics, right? Because that's a big theme throughout the book. And I love how you break it down into an operating system yeah. and separately values and goals, because I think that's really interesting. Like those two definitions are really interesting to me. But talk first, I mean, maybe about what drew you to Stoics and Stoicism and what the distinction between an operating system and values and goals means to you. Yeah, yeah. So the talking about how thick, how random things are and how you discover things in a random way. So this book was 99% done. Like I already put all the chapters together. I already had like the book almost almost done and to be ready, you know, ready to go for the final edit. And then I stumbled on a stoic philosophy and I was blown away by that. I called my editor and I said, I really want to, you know, learn more about stoics. So the deadline, and we had we set a deadline, which was my idea because I wanted to you know, kind of to force myself to finish the book. I said the deadline we have. Let's you know, let's put it on uh, on ice for now. And I just want to uh, I just want to work on Stoics for as long as I, as I need to. And what attracted me to Stoics is this: when we are born, like we are not given an instruction manual for life. The way we behave is basically influenced by, especially in early life, by our parents, then by our friends, and then by life. Just life kind of happens to us and we learn certain lessons, sometimes right ones, sometimes wrong ones. And that becomes an operating system of the way we behave. What Stoic philosophy did for me, and in a lot of time, the word philosophy scares people because it sounds like a very big word, but all it is, it means love, uh, love of wisdom. And Stoic philosophy, basically an operating system for this life that is kind of religion neutral. In other words, it doesn't compete with other religions. You know, it, you, can, you can use that and sub, if you're religious, it can supplement your religion. If you're not religious, it provides a very good system just to handle life. And I think the goal at the end of the day uh, for that brain system is to reduce your negative, uh, uh, negative volatility of your emotions. You know, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do a stock talk here. I'm trying to use the words that listeners can relate to. <laughs> yeah, volatility is a good one. Yeah, yeah. And so, the, and so the first part of the book, when I talk about operating systems, are basically just like, how, how can you adapt this in your life to reduce stress of negative emotions um, caused by negative emotions? And, this, and the values to me are basically how do you want to live your life to have a good and meaningful life? You know, that's kind of, and that's kind of, this is where the values come in. You know, the one negative visualization was really interesting to me because um, especially in performance industries, Mm -hmm. you know, like investing is or sports, like when you see people talk about like golfers, they'll do like positive visualization. They'll stand over the putt 
and imagine it going in. But I found negative visualization to be really interesting. This idea that you should have an image for what things not working out looks like. It's almost like set the bar really low and try to jump over it so that you're never too disappointed and let your emotions get down. How do you tap into that one? And like, what does it mean to you? Well, there are so many ways you can apply it. So the way you use it right now is one of them, right? You basically, when you are buying a stock, you imagine in, or, you know, or when you run a portfolio, you imagine the portfolio being down 30%. Um, in the book, I, I talk about an example where the, our company was very little, very tiny. We got this large client. And, the, you know, and when we got him, you know, when, we, you know, when they hired us, we went through this interview process. We interviewed him as much as he interviewed us. And it seemed like a good fit. Like, you know, he read the brochure, you know, went through the whole spiel. And then like a month later, I start hearing that he's kind of started to inquire about our daily or monthly performance and, or weekly performance, sorry. And I realized there is a good chance. So this guy is measuring us against something else, like on a weekly basis, which all of you know, who listens to this podcast knows that's the worst thing you can do because I have no, I have zero insight what our portfolio is going to do next, next week, next month, even next year. And, uh, and then I realized there is a good chance I might lose him as a client, and, which for us at the time would be a big deal. So I basically visualized that he's gone. I didn't fire him. Uh, today, I would probably have, today we are in a different situation. Today, I would probably talk, have a conversation with him. And if I could not change the way he looks at things, I probably would say we probably need to part. At the time, I just basically visualized that we're going to lose him. And I adjusted my corporate budgeting decisions accordingly, assuming that we don't have that revenue. And I think three or four months later, he left. And Elliot, like, it's time, like, it's almost like, like it did not, it did not hurt at all. And that was, a, that, and I thought, wow. And the, the irony of this, I did this and I was not, I was not, I did not even know how to spell stoic philosophy at the time. It just was like, they say, this speaks of a, throughout life, you pick up these tricks. Well, except stoic philosophy puts it in the kind of in a framework. But let me give you another way to use this uh, negative visualization. It helps you to appreciate life more. Um, let me give you this example. Um, my kids, my 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 two daughters. My my son is twenty one. He's in college already. But my two daughters, one is sixteen, as one is eight. So my sixteen year old basically has two years of school left. School left. So in the past, uh, when I had to drive him to school, I look at it as a, as a chore. Because you know, but then I realized that this was this was a while back that I really have a limited amount of time with them. Because at some point, like I only have 400 times, like with my 16-year-old Hannah, I only have two years left, which is really maybe like 400 times I'll be able to drive her to school. That's it. After this, she'll go to college. I won't be able to do this. And now it changed the way I look at this. First of all, I welcome an opportunity to drive them to school. Number, two, number one. Number two, when we are in the car, I'm actually giving them attention of time. Actually, we listen to music together, we talk, but I am trying to inhale every second of that limited amount of time I have with them in the car. So that's changed how, um, uh, you know, uh, how, how I look at it. And another way is, there's, there's a third way to look at it. When something bad is happening to you, you can, you can always, and especially in our society today, what we, we perceive as bad is over, a lot of times to other people would not look bad, okay? If you are in the Ukraine, in the east of Ukraine today, whatever is happening to you and me here, uh, uh, John and Elliot, would not what would appear to be just walk in the park, right? So a lot of times, uh, if you look at what's happening to you and you say, "Well, my you know, like my my kids are healthy, my wife is have you know is healthy." I have, I'm sitting in an air-conditioned office, upsetting, you know, ups, ups, uh, obsessing about you know, my portfolio being down. Things could have been so much worse. I, you know, and I think that's a, that's a negative visualization uh, allows you to appreciate that even though we all have problems at times, a lot of times, not all the time, but most of the time, these problems are really not as huge as we think they are. Yeah, I think that's a lot about like putting having perspective, right? And then 
you know, you talked about this idea in the Stoic chapters. I forgot exactly which one, but it really struck me too. Um, like how sensitive we are to changes in conditions rather than absolute level. And that's a big part of why we get bogged down in certain things, it seems. Yeah, so the, uh, there's Stoics that have this concept called reframing. And reframing, basically, just think about something happens to you that, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and then you, it, uh, that event instance into your mind. And at this point in time, you can package it any way you want. You can package, the, package it as negative or positive. Like, like with my kids, when, when I drive them to school, I reframe them into positive experience, right? From a negative experience. Um, when somebody upsets you, when somebody tells you, so they, let, let me just pause for a second. Let me go to the main concept of Stoic philosophy and then we we'll apply reframing. The main concept, and that's the concept that really sold me on Stoic philosophy. That's when I read that, that's what really got me into it is um, Epictetus, which is a, a Stoic philosopher, had this concept called dichotomy of control. And as investors, we all know this one. And he says, basically, some things are up to us, some things aren't. Some things are internal, the, one, the ones that are up to us, some things are external. Now, what does it mean? Well, there are very few things in our life that, that are internal, that are up to us, we can control. It's basically what we think, how, to think of, how we think about it, and how we act. Everything else is not up to us. You go, you drive into a grocery store, you have zero control over the streetlights, if they're going to be green or red. You're renting a car at the airport, you have zero control if the clerk is uh, nice to you or rude, rude to you, okay? And if since you have no control over or control over that, suddenly you can, um, and this is where my stepmom always tells me where I fail, which this is the part when to be better at this, okay? But it's a... Once you realize that you have very little control how other people behave, then you're gonna be then you can adjust your own behavior. Then you can reframe it and realize when the person is like think about it, there's seven billion people in the world. Do you really expect to go through life and everybody behave in the perfect way that accommodates you? Really? Not really, it's that's impossible, right? So you refer you rec- you're recognizing that a lot of things, and by the way, how your portfolio performs in the short term has absolutely you have zero control over it, you know. But as an investor, the only thing you can control is your process. The outcome of that, especially in a short period of time, you have zero control over. Um, and I think recognizing that, like that was extremely, you know, uh, that was very helpful to me. But anyway, so the when when somebody upsets you, it's actually you're the one who allowing yourself to get upset, right? Because you framed what they said in the way, in the negative way. A lot of times, Stoics would tell you just frame it in a neutral way. And, and so those are kind of like the reframing and, I, I'm, and I'm not doing the, those concepts justice right now, but reframing and sto- negative realization are probably one of the most important, and you know, Reframing negative visualization and the economy of control, probably the three core uh, stoic concepts from the, from the operating system. Yeah, I think they're all really interesting and relevant to investors in any time. But like, you know, reframing, uh, one of the things I've been thinking about was like, you know, are certain things mistakes or are they lessons, right? There's a distinction there, but there's a meaningful one in how you frame it and what you do with that knowledge. And then on dichotomy of control, it's like one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, both personally and with respect to some of my uh, colleagues, et cetera, is, you know, there's this behavioral bias called the illusion of control. Yes. And as you said, like, we don't control what's going to happen with the market. We can't control what's going to happen with our stocks. And, you know, I find myself thinking I need to work more and more and more, like maybe partly out of guilt, partly out of sensing opportunity. And partly out of, you know, uh, fearing I might be making mistakes beyond what I've already done in certain areas. You try to work more and more and more, give up doing certain of the hobbies that give you a release and just, you know, keep digging in because you feel that there's a way for you to take control of a situation where there is none. And I think it's a pretty powerful, like both, like you said, operating system to like kind of step away and realize that you, you can't, you don't actually control this stuff. 
No, I, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Reframing, I find to be especially interesting too. Cause like, you know, I, I mean, it's interesting with negative visualization, you kind of set a low bar, but it, it's a form of reframing in a lot of ways. You know, you, you visualize something that, that goes wrong and then it's almost cathartic when it, when it does go wrong. Cause it doesn't matter. You were ready for it anyway. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, you've introduced me to the Stoics beyond what I'd been exposed before. And I found it to be very helpful for myself. Um, one of the other things that I, that you introduced me to that I, I had, you know, thought about these things and not exactly this way, but your chapter abracadabra, where you talk about the four modes of communication, the idea that there's a preacher, prosecutor, politician, and scientist, and using debate as the quest for knowledge. Like that is something that really has struck with me. I've always believed in this idea of setting ego aside and having conversations with people that are tense in the search for wisdom, where each person is trying to learn. And it's not that you're trying to convince the other person of what you believe. You're trying to lay out your argument so that you could figure out what you need to learn for yourself and hear their answers so that you can internalize what's different. You know, I feel like a lot of society's problems would be solved if people approach debate in this way. But you know, it was, it was really interesting to me. How do you stumble on that? Where do you, where do you see that? Yes. No, so no, so that one actually, and I and I and I, and I, and I said it came from uh, from Adam Grant's book, but he didn't come up with that. He borrowed it from Philip, and I'm going blank on the last name. Uh, uh, his colleague from a uh, so that's that idea came to me. Like that's that's where I got the idea, and I think it developed a little bit in a slightly different direction than he did. And I think uh, you're really good, good, just from knowing you personally, at having these debates in the search of wisdom. Well, that's when you and I, when you and I, when you and I talk stocks, right? Like this is exactly how I approach it, right? There's, there's absolutely. What's the point of like? If okay, think about it. If you come into a conversation, especially when we talk about stocks, that time will discover truth. So you and I, all we're trying to do is to get to the, to really get to the truth, right? So it's really, I, I have. Either I convince you or not, the truth is going to show up. You know what the you know what the earnings are going to be, or what the price earnings are going to be. All these things together at some point in time, anyway. So then, all I'm trying to do is to listen to what you're saying, and then try to understand where you're coming from, and uh, and then and to, and to learn from you. And uh, so the the my book soul in the game the other title that was in competing you know the, the other title what I, I you know my original title though was going to be student of life and that is kind of how i think of myself a student of life if you think of yourself as a student of life then there are so many so many positive things will happen to you number number one you will uh you're constantly going to be learning and you see things opportunities to learn number two you will never be sure in everything. You're going to have some core values that are sure in, okay? But you're never going to be sure in everything. And because you're not sure in everything 100%, then you're going to be mindful. You're going to open yourself to you know, to see things from different perspectives. And you uh, that's another reason. Um, and also, and this is probably the most important part, you will less likely to become arrogant. Because the arrogant is a person who knows answers for everything. If you're not, if you are in the student of life mode, if you are in the learning mode, and or in the scientist mode, and this, you know, if you're just looking for truth, you know, then it's a lot more difficult to become arrogant. Because that's what gets us in. Like that's the arrogance in investing is a kind of it's a you want to be thoughtfully arrogant. Okay, what what does it mean? Thoughtful arrogant is when you've done a lot of work. And through your research, you got enough confidence to basically say, I'm going to buy this stock. And how much of people are selling me that stuff, that stock, because they have a different opinion. But I've done enough work and that, and I came to the conclusion that I'm right. And it's, I'm not arrogant. This, the, the difference between thoughtfully arrogant and arrogant, arrogant is a person who basically, I am right because I am. Like, you, you know, and I think that's, and, the, and I think that is probably, um, the biggest risk to investors who had a 
a very good run for a while. They, they feel like they've got it figured out and uh, their process gets looser. Uh, and, uh, and arrogance kicks in and kind of arrogance you know, takes over. So if you are like, anyway, so that's kind of the, that's the student of life part. But, you know, any, it's a, we, by the way, those four modes you mentioned, we all spend our time in those modes anyway. Okay. When I try to convince my kids to, uh, to do something, uh, I'm uh, either in a, in a preacher or, uh, or in a uh, price fear mode, right? Uh, uh, you know, or, or politician. So what, what I, what when I stalk her sometimes when they don't. Yeah, listen. yeah, that's <laughs> fine. Or when you when when you go on a date, I promise you, we are in the politician mode, right? Because we are just telling the person we are meeting for the first time. We are disagreeing with the person very little, and we just try to say things in the way the person would like us, right? That's what politicians do, right? Absolutely. And or you or you look for a job. So it's a there is nothing wrong with those modes, but here's the problem. If you spend most of your time in a politician, uh, prosecutor, or preacher mode, those are the modes where you learn the least, because those are the kind of kind of those are outward looking modes, right? This is those are the modes that you you learn the least. If you want to grow as an individual, you want to spend a lot more time being in the in the scientist mode, and I think that's that's the distinction I make. And I would argue anybody who's listening to this podcast probably wants to learn about investing and life, et cetera, you know, would want to spend a good chunk of, you know, that time in a scientist mode. And I'll tell you this, um, and I talk about this at the end of the chapter. Um, so I wrote this chapter and my, my son, John and I are flying to Chicago from Denver to pick up my, my daughter from the, uh, from the camp last year. And my son read the chapter on the plane. And so my my so we are in Chicago now, and we're walking on the Magic Mile, and we're debating something. And my son says, "Dad, are you sure you are in the scientist mode?" And I caught myself somewhere in the middle of the conversation. The ego took over, and I went from a scientist mode into uh, into a prosecutor mode. <laughs> yeah, and, not good. Yeah. So what I did, I after I wrote the chapter, I printed it out and shared it with all my friends and all my colleagues because I want them to kind of, I want us to have this framework. So if we catch us, you know, well, if, we, if we catch each other being in the prosecutor mode instead of scientist mode, we'll tell them, we'll, you know, we'll tell each other. So, yeah. Right. And once you know the framework too, you could start asking yourself like, hey, am I really acting like the scientist right now or am I being something yeah. different? Yeah, and for a scientist, this is like the, this is what's important for a scientist. A thought, you know, everything is just uh, a theory, right? And then you just try to prove it to disprove it, right? And uh, and and also, what's important, and this is a uh, the reason I, c- I call this chapter abracadabra, is because uh, you know most people don't know what it means, but uh, if I remember right, abracadabra means I create as I speak. So think about this. A lot of times we start believing into, we, a thought enters our mind. Then we start debating this thought. And the very first position we took on this, that becomes our belief. So we have to be very careful of how we actually form our beliefs. We don't, so we don't allow them to form randomly just because we stumbled on somebody on the street and started debating this concept. Yeah, this idea of like, testing theories and, you know, getting in this mindset is how George Soros has approached markets, his Mm -hmm. whole position sizing, his whole, you know, it's hypothesis. Start seeing if the market gives you feedback that you're right and lean into it when you are like, everything's a testable hypothesis at first. I think that's exactly right. And, you know, you talked about arrogance a bit. And I think a lot about how like investing is simultaneously an exercise in humility and conviction. Yes. And those two are self-contradictory. And you need to have perspective on where you fall between the two and when you need to kind of, you know, lean more one way than the other. Because um, if you don't, I mean, the market's going to humble you. Um, and if you're not, if you don't have enough conviction, it'll take you out of your best ideas. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. 
So that's why this is so hard, right? <laughs> um, I, yeah, that's why I call it thoughtfully arrogant, right? Because you, you know, you need to have some amount of arrogance, and that, but, but that arrogance has to be earned. Meaning, right? Not, but, but let me clarify this: not by your past decisions, by, but by your research that relates directly to that idea. Yeah, your process, right? But so let's let, let, let's use that to talk about your chapter, Opera Pain Investing. Oh gosh. What went wrong in 2015? So yeah, 2015 actually, I think if I remember right, it started out kind of okay. And then a few months into it, uh, like uh, like uh, one stock would decline 20, 30% or something, and another stock would do the same thing. And you know, and it just ended up being uh like she was dropping every other week. It seemed like every other week, it probably was every, you know, every month or so. And the difficulty was that the market wasn't really like, I think it was, it was up a little bit or down a little bit, but it wasn't really doing that, you know, that bad. But what happens, like we usually have things, you know, stocks that at any point in time are not doing well, you know, price-wise or sometimes fundamentally. But there was something else that's going up or something that upsets that. You know, so there was some things going, okay, some of them are doing well, some of them are doing poorly, but overall doing okay. Um, and this time around, it's just, we had a lot of new clients and those clients only saw me buy a stock and then decline 20% the day after, this kind of thing. And it was kind of getting, to, you know, it, it started to get to me. And then in October of 2015, in October, I forget, or November, I was, uh, early November, I was in Israel and I went on a trip that was planned maybe six, eight months or a year before. And uh, we were in Sfat, which is this kind of this magical little, you know, little town in Israel. Um, and one of, one of our positions just declined 80% overnight. Like just, and the interesting part was I wasn't sure if this decline is temporary. Like, you know, and just the earnings suddenly they went earning, like it was eight hour stock and went from earning two dollars to nothing or to 20 cents, maybe. And and I wasn't and I wasn't sure if I'm wrong about this. You know, you know, and actually ended up in this in this case, this stock ended up being basically worth 80% less. And I remember. Um, I remember like all my, my friends, we were at a party and there was a loud music and everybody was dancing and smiling. And I, and I have this, this burning pain inside of me. And it's almost like there are two worlds. There is this, this burning world of pain inside of me. And then this outside world that is absolutely happy. And people are smiling at, at me and my face is trying to project smile. and. I remember thinking, why don't I then understand how how bad I feel? This just, and and this is, and it's you feel incredibly, incredibly lonely. And this is probably the first and only time in my life I was truly, truly depressed. And so what I did, um, I came to a hotel uh, that evening, and I ended up writing letters to clients and kind of walked through all our, you know, kind of like our portfolio. And, and, you know, and, and basically told them you know, exactly what I think. And that actually was incredibly therapeutic because when, you, when I rationally, like, so what happens to us, uh, Stoics had a wonderful saying about this, which I don't remember right now, but something along the lines that things usually not as bad as we make them to be, you know, because what happens, something, you know, our mind is a very good amplifier of, you know, of bad emotions. So we just talk ourselves like we, we, you know, something small, relatively small happens and we just blow it up. Um, but what, what, what Stoics would tell you, if you break it up into smaller things, and Marcus Aurelius uh, would basically, that's what he would tell you, would just, you want to like, do a couple of things. You want to ex- explain things in as plain language as possible without using big metaphors in, in the plain language. So like, you know, like when you go to a restaurant and it's, you know, the fence in the restaurant, the more the longer is the description of the item on the menu. Like it would be uh, wild, wild Alaskan salmon with uh, 
uh, I don't know, from herbs, with herbs from Atlanta, from Atlanta, I don't know, like with this, you know, with glazed, whatever. So you have this long description uh, where uh, Marcus Aurelius would say, it's a dust fish with herbs on top of it, right? And so you want to, so what you want to do, whatever the problem is, you want to break it, you want to explain it to yourself in the, on just a very bare level. Okay, take out all defensive words. And then you want to break it up into small, like into small issues, which is when it comes to portfolio, it's very easy to do. You just approach each company at one company at a time. And, and, and actually, I did exactly that. So when I wrote my letter to clients, I went through the stocks in a portfolio and I said, this stock is down this much, but if you think this company is worth two or three times more, here's how I get there. Like, you know, the conversation you and I would have, right? We would talk about the company's earnings power. You would talk about what conservative multiple you can put in this, the worst case, this kind of thing, right? Like the conversation you and I would have, on, you know, quite often. And once you, once I went through this, I realized that actually I had a very good portfolio and just a lot of stuff got beat up. A few of them had a short-term problem. One of them had a problem that's probably not going to be solved, but it was a, I forget, maybe it was a three or 4% position. It was not, it's not something, or you know, maybe even in the worst case, maybe say five, but I could recover from that, right? Um, and uh, and then I look at other stocks, you know, I, overall I had a good portfolio. And just going through this process, kind of line by line, helped me to feel better about this. By the time I send the letter to clients, I like, I don't know, maybe 70% of that pain was gone. Not all of it, but a lot of the pain was gone. And uh, in fact, if it's kind of interesting, you know, talk about framing, right? If at the time I looked at my portfolio performance, of, I took 2014 and 2015 and averaged it, I still had a good performance. And obviously I could not do that at the time, but if I took 2015 and 2016, 2017 performance and averaged those three, again, I did not know at the time what 16 and 17 would look, I actually got a great performance. It's that, it's a, how you frame it, right? It's a, if you, you know, it's frame, you know, how you frame it, that has a lot to do with it too. Um, and uh, what I also realized, and this is a very, very important in our industry, we are usually very competitive people. When I say we, I'm looking and talking to John, I'm talking about you, Elliot, and most of my friends, because like most people I know in this industry who I'm friends with, they have, they are, they have soul in a game. They absolutely love what they're doing. And, but unfortunately there's a downside with that. We tie our ego to that. We start saying our self-worth is what our performance is. But remember how we talk about the economy of control? You have zero, you, all you can do, you, you have a control of, of your process, how hard you work, like, well, how seriously you take this, how, you know, how well, you know, how, how, how basic, how well you design and execute your process. You have zero control about everything else, right? And when you tie our ego to the performance of the portfolio, you're basically tying it to a bus that, you know, that's driven by a drunken, a drunken monkey. And you have no idea where it's going to take you tomorrow, right? Um, and uh, we had a case, uh, there, was a, there was a very famous value investor, I'm not going to name names, but, you know, who, you know, managed billions of dollars, closed his, his hedge fund. Um, and, uh, you know, and he, he was incredibly wealthy at the time, probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars, but he closed his cash funds and basically took elevated to the 10th floor of his Manhattan office and jumped. Then, you know, this was a person that was an incredible amount of pain. And what he did, he tied the performance of his portfolio to his self-worth, which is something you can't do. Um, so anyway, so this is kind of the 2015 story, but let me tell you the story of this chapter. That's you now the so in 2016, when I already kind of the pain that they I can still recall the pain vividly, but most of the pain was gone. I and maybe late 2015, where I still had some pain, I basically went through so that when you, this pain you go through, the, this pain you know, when you go through this pain, it could be you can waste it 
or you can capture it and you can learn from it and it can make you better. Because what pain does, it basically, it reveals the frailties in our process. And this pain, usually in any creative activity, first of all, pain is part of any creative activity, period. If you are working on assembly factory and you know for Fiat or something on Fiat uh, assembly factory, you're going to experience very little creative pain because that's not a creative process. Any creative process comes with pain. So visualize that at some point you're going to get it. Okay, that's number one. Um, number two, if you go through this and you learn nothing from this, you wasted the pain. My first book, Active Value Investing, was a product of pain. We, uh, we, uh, when the dot com mark, uh, when dot com bubble blew up, we, we did great. And then, because we didn't own dot com stocks, but then a lot of high quality companies that were basically fully value started to decline, and it was a, we had a very painful 2022, and that made me look into stock, you know what 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 happened to stocks in the past. And that's how I came up with the sideways markets. And, you know, I, that's how my first book came about, Active Value Investing. So I actually have benefited. I kind of captured the pain and benefited from this. The 2015 made me re reevaluate our process. And I realized that I have this framework, quality evaluation and growth. And after that pain, I made quality absolute. In other words, I will not compromise on quality. It doesn't matter how cheap the company is, et cetera. I don't care. I'm just not going to buy. You know, I'm not going to compromise on quality. And that has been incredible. Like, that has saved me a lot of money since. So this is, so I didn't, I did not, so that pain I went through allowed me to see the cracks in my process and made my, our process today is exponentially better than it was in 2015 because I learned from that pain. Um, so the, uh, but anyway, so going back how this chapter came about, I was going to write uh, about an opera. Like, you know, like I usually, like a lot of times I do in my, in my, in my letter, I was going to write about Pagliacci. And in the Pagliacci opera, there's this scene uh, that <laughs> as I was kind of describing this, that, you know, this scene, I realized oh my God, I can relate to it so much. And the scene is this, you have this circus come to a small town and the circus owner's wife is cheating. Uh, the, uh, he's a Pagliacci. He's the, he's the circus owner and he's also a performer. And his wife is cheating with somebody else, with one of the locals. And right before... Uh, right before he, you know, he's about to go on stage and sing this, uh, and basically be in this play, where in that play, a wife cheats on the husband, and he was going to play a husband in that play. Right before he was about to go on stage and you know and, and be in this play, he finds out that his wife just cheated on him, and he has to go on stage and pretend and put a smile on his face, and and even though he's dying inside. And that's what basically, like when you go through this, when you go through those painful experiences, that's exactly how you feel. Like you're basically the, uh, I remember in that 20, 2012 was a, 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 a painful period for us. And I remember I was training interns and I had to pretend that I had to wear this face, like everything is great. Even though inside I was like dying because like all the pain I was experiencing. So, so that area, so just, just to make it clear, my wife did not have an affair with a circus clown. I didn't <laughs> like that. Just, I just want to clarify this. Uh, but that's exact, but I felt exactly like that, uh, that Pagliacci in that opera, because I felt like I had to put up that face and pretend that everything is good, even though inside I was, you know, I was really hurting. And uh, so I wrote about this experience and I wrote about 2015 and I, let, I could not bring myself to publish it. I just felt so vulnerable and, and, you know, and, uh, and I just basically found it away. And then when I wrote the book, I felt a little bit more secure about myself. And I felt like in the middle of the book, it's kind of, it's going to be lost between other chapters. So that's how it kind of uh, went into the book. 
And here I am making sure everyone knows about it. But that's you know, right, that's, that's kind right. of like journaling, right? You wrote it not necessarily to have anyone read it, but you wrote it because I'm sure it helped you work through this. And you know, we're recording this right now, and the market's in a bear market. And I think one of the things you said in the chapter, you know, in 2012, you didn't necessarily take the right lessons into your 2015 experience. But yes, maybe talk a little bit about how this. 2015 experience has helped you contend with right now today. Um, well, and you can do that on two dimensions, if you will, maybe yeah. emotionally, like how are you handling what could be pain? Yeah. And then second, like, you know, how have changes in your process, you yeah. know, that reignited creativity you talk about uh, changed how you approach investing itself. I'll do this, but let me tell you why I put this chapter in the book. And, and this is the only investment. This is probably the, if you are listening to this and you're struggling right now because of what the market is doing, that chapter was put there for you because that's why I did it because I feel like I could help somebody by sharing my experience. And by the way, just in, and I discuss this in a chapter, every great investor went through a period of pain. There was this great Canadian investor, Peter Candil, and he had, and he, you know, and he wrote a book, and I think, uh, there was always something to do. And the beauty of that book is that originally it was written like a journal, like a like personal journal. So the beauty of that is that the thoughts in the book are not like there is no revisionist history there. And he writes about the pain. And this is, again, this is, the, by the way, Peter Kandil. This is the person Warren Buffett called when he was looking for Todd and Ted, before he found Todd and Ted. This is one of the greatest investors of our generation, or of, of last two generations. So he was a phenomenal investor. And he, in the early 90s, he had the most miserable two or three years. There's a lot of self-doubt. So that happens to every investor. Uh, Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, he got blown up in the 1929 depression. A great, in the, in the, he, was, he got blown up in Great Depression. And the intelligent investor of the book probably would not have happened if he did not, you know, if, if he, you know, if he did not go through the Great Depression. So, so I guess Ben Graham learned that valuation matters in the 1929. <laughs> uh, um, so a couple of things. So I learned that for me, the, you know, for to avoid the mistakes that I made in the, you know, uh, 2015, I cannot compromise on quality. That was the company that the company that went basically 80 percent overnight and just never came back. That company had a over levered balance sheet, but what appeared to be looking, you know, higher, you know, kind of looked very cheap on earnings. And when it stumbled just a little bit, the balance sheet would not afford the company to survive. So, so uh, another thing that I learned over time, and since then, like and this, and this may be the lessons that I learned, in, you know, some other years that were like in the context of a portfolio were not as painful, but is that I never compromise on management. Like I never, like I stopped by like. I stopped buying companies where I question management motives or the quality of management. So to me, quality is uncompromising. So, as, so that changed the process. Uh, so that was a big change in our process. Um, I think the, the way I psychologically handle the, surprisingly this year was not like, you know, this year I think we're just doing, we are doing a case. So I, I didn't like, our portfolio is doing a case. So I didn't have to, practice this but uh, 2020 like was a more painful because we didn't go up as nearly as much as the market did and uh you know we were up and i you know i basically just looked at things i can control and things i can't control uh, i looked at our decisions and i felt our decisions were right that's why i didn't i would be lying if i, I would be telling that i didn't have some residue of discomfort, but I wasn't like, you know, but kind of framing it in these terms that this is not controllable and look at my decisions. I'm happy with my decisions. 
that allowed me to deal with pain better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, nice, not, not bad to not be in the most painful position right now, but, um, it's definitely a helpful framework to carry with you anywhere. And to know that you've gone through something like this, I'd imagine the next time around just feels. Oh, it's different. a matter of time. And I, by the way, just speaking of negative visualization, I, it's a matter of time before being in a painful position. So I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I didn't, I don't feel like I got the whole thing figured out and this, you know, et cetera. I think in the chapter, you said something to the effect of every time you buy a stock, you just imagine it going down 30%. That's fine. Immediately. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Which, yeah, which is <laughs> at some point becomes useful because they do, you know, they do go down 30%. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Well, Vitaly, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for, uh, joining, have loved talking to you about life, wisdom, investing, and our debates offline. I wish uh, we should we should record some of them sometimes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you guys did a great job as a podcast. So I, you know, uh, I'm so glad I, you know, you, you know, you had a chance to talk. Absolutely. Thank this you. This was two years in the waiting, man. We finally right. made it happen. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, very exciting. All right. I'll jump in just to say uh, thank you, Vitaly, as well. I've been kind of lurking in the background here because I, kn- I knew that Elliot had pre- prepared some terrific questions uh, for the discussion. Um, so thank you for uh, you know sharing your perspectives, your wisdom. Uh, so much to learn. I'm I'm I consider myself a very uh, beginner stoic. So I, I'm definitely uh, learning a ton just by listening to you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed this special episode. We'll be back uh, next week with the uh, regular crew. Take care for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.